Tonight's guest on Set the Trend Live, Mervyn Lynn. TV executive June Sarpong. US recording artist Ivan Mateus and Angie Stone. UK recording artist Junior Giscom. And now, here come your hosts. Welcome. Good evening, lads. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, hey, it's such a pleasure to see your guys face on Set the Trend podcast every week at 10 p.m. Welcome, Mr. Eastender. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Good evening. How are you? Yeah, how are you? You're always talking about us, but how, how are you been? Oh, let me do you guys first. Come on. You're rude. You're rude. You're rude. How are you? How's your week been? Uh, it's been... It's been a very interesting week. Uh, very Tell interesting. What, have you made money? Have you done big deals? What? Uh, <laughs> yeah, a couple of deals in the couple of deals in the pipeline. Just waiting to sign the dotted line. Um, work's been fine, but it's you know they say they say seven days is a long day is a long time in the in the media world, and it's been amazing. It's been an amazing seven days, and we're gonna. I'm sure we're gonna discuss some of those things in a sec. <laughs> okay then. Well, we'll well we might pursue that more at the end of the show when we're when we're. Um, let me just make a note about that. Um, how are you, Reggie? Heavy man styles. How are you, sir? Yeah, still waiting for my uh, um, contracts from East Ender and yourself. Um, uh, it's not imminent yet, but yeah, it's uh, been. I'm um, all good. Brushed off my feet. Busy, busy, busy as per usual, and um, it's great to be back on a Saturday, entertaining the nation. With uh, some great stuff. And contract for what? Did I miss something? Oh yeah, big up Jerry Bascom. It's his birthday today, so I forgot to mention. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jerry, big up Jerry from NeederPlaceToGo.co.uk, and also the Soul of London Radio. Yeah, the, my my radio station. Happy happy Excellent. birthday, mate. Yeah, but what is the contracts for? What you what contracts are you waiting on? DJ booking, innit? You know me, you're always hustling for work out of you too. Oh, imagine, cool. imagine your own co-hosts. You can't even now. I know how Rory feels on the the Joe Budden podcast. You need to get your um viewer game up, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know. I need to get the fans the fans up. Yeah, at least double figures. When you get to double figures, then me and Eastender will definitely consider you. You know what I mean? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, lads. So, welcome to Set the Trend podcast. If you joined us now on Facebook, can you share the link for us, please? Um, if you joined us on YouTube, welcome. Um, can you subscribe to our, our page? So if you haven't already, then you get to know when we post our case studies, our profiles, our video um, interviews with some of the movers and shakers and icons in the Street Sounds history game. So welcome well, once again to, to set the trend. And this is about, this is where we document the history and legacy of Street Sounds. and. Street sounds have been around from the early 80s, I think that, and that phrase has been probably around about since then, 83, 82. Um, we look to document the history and we talk to the icons of the game and people who have, who have had influence um, and have helped the street sounds grow. Whether that be community radio stations, uh, DJs, um, from reggae to hip hop to soul to jungle to R and B, right throughout street sounds tentacle spreads large and wide, and also the people who who have had a lot of influence, or have given us a lot of influence, should I say, um, in in the game, and none other than the gentleman that we're interviewing today. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to interviewing Mervyn Lynn, um, big honcho big name at BMG Records, also at Blues and Soul, um, to name a couple of things that he's done in his lifetime. We, we're going to be talking to him about his life, about his times, about the influence that he had on Street Sounds. Because let's not get it twisted in any form. He helped Street Sounds grow. And we're going to, and we're going to talk about that throughout, the, throughout our next hour and 15 minutes. We've also got some big guests. He's got on some of his friends that we're going to be talking to as well. Um, June Sarpong, 
BBC One's head head black honcho, should I say? Should, should, should I should I call it? Should, should I say that? Creative diversity. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and um, we, we're going to be no, she's director of creative diversity. Yeah. Just to get yes. her full title, mm -hmm. and we'll be talking to her as well about uh, about Murph. Um, we'll also be talking to Angie Stone about Merv as well. He's got a big black book, hasn't he? I mean, Angie Stone is one of the, 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 the names in that black book. Yeah, I can't wait till later on when he starts reeling them off. You know, he's yeah. this person, that one's like, whoa. <laughs> now, can I? And Ivan Mateus as well will be in, in the building. He's a songwriter and he's written some big hits for some of the artists that um, Merv has had the pleasure of marketing, building, growing. Um, and, you know, helping create a legacy with. So we'll be talking to him as well. And also we've got a special guest in the building as well to finish off the show with, live performance, by one of the Street Sounds artist icons. Does that sound right? Does that sound a big enough kind of, of celebration of his name? Come on, man. It is, of isn't course. it? And one of, the, and one of our favourite, favourite, favourite records of Street Sounds history, one of our favourite records at all. One of... We would call it moving into the second half of our history. Mm -hmm. so the first half was like a lot of rare groove, a lot of Motown, you know, that kind of sounding kind of music. Yeah. And he came along in 1990 with Morning Will Come. And that, that changed the, the game. intro alone for DJs. The intro alone, Tony Nix, Barry White. Um, just to name a few. Reggie Styles. Yeah, yeah Reggie Styles. Styles. <laughs> I'm glad you put me in there. Um, Reggie was probably humming along at that point. Um, humming along? What are you talking about? I've been in lyrics. I can even tell you my lyrics from back in the day. In time, they come and said, dance after ram, dance after ram, it's after ram. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's, my, that's my like Gina, Gina Yashere look. <laughs> um yeah so we'll be uh we've got a packed schedule ahead of us and um we'll have merv up in about 10 minutes or so so yeah, so in the meantime we'll welcome to you again whether you're on facebook or youtube you're on facebook share the link for us one time if you're on youtube um, subscribe to the channel Good evening to all our listeners that we see out there um, that are joining us. We do, do see you. Um, mm -hmm. Hello and good, good evening. If you have any questions for our guests, please put it in the chat and we will also ask them the question on your behalf. So I don't think that you're not part of it. It's an interactive evening today. So you are part of it as well. So please feel free to ask, ask the questions. So we've got a packed show to get through. So let's get through to it. Let's deal with the matter. Let's deal with the bigger story this week. Are the royal family racist? William says, I think we're not racist. <laughs> but that was part of a storyline, wasn't it? Um, did you watch did you watch um um Harry and Meghan and Oprah Winfrey on Sunday? Yeah, I did actually. I thought it was a very gracious interview. I think she was very gracious in what she uh did and what she said and how she went about it. Um I feel that. Uh, the backlash that she received in people saying because she's an actress, she put it on. I think that was totally disgusting. Um, a, a, a woman who's currently pregnant and uh, in a volatile position, speaking her truth, uh, should always be heard. And um, I just felt that, you know, some of the media took it in a very, very bad way and continued with that vitriol that they um, uh, had for her for the last two, three years. Um, and I thought it was very, very bad. Um, but um, apart from that, you know, did you, it's, did you, it's, did you enjoy it was, the interview? No, it was good that we opened up this, uh, that a discussion was opened up and, um, you know, that will continue. Obviously, there's other news that happened uh, this week as well, sadly, um, which has um, taken over the news agenda as well. But I'm sure it will come back to that. East, did you see, did you see, did you see the interview? I saw the interview. Uh, I watched a little bit of it on Sunday. Uh, I wanted to see it firsthand, but because of the time difference, I did fall asleep. So I made sure I caught 
majority of it on the Monday on ITV. Um, again, yeah, nice interview. In, you know, Oprah does Oprah. Cool, calm, you know, love the way she de- gets she gets the answers out of people. Just nice and calm and relaxed. I love an interviewer who interviews without shouting. You know, I like calmness. And, you know, she did well. Um, you know, <laughs> I, it's also moved so quickly. You know, it's now like, you know, who shot JR? It is, isn't it? Um, Piers Morgan got shot. That's a, that's a definite, oh, he walked off um, with his head in a, with his self in a tizzy. Um, although I think Piers was wanting that off anyway. I think he knows he can earn more money as a soloist now but, off of GMB than he can. But here's, on- but here's the question they're all asking now, though, right? It's like, who said it? Who said what? Oh, who said that the baby... <laughs> what was it? What? Um, they were it? concerned oh, about... Actually, getting right. Actually, they were concerned exactly about the colour. Yeah, and yeah. concerned about the colour being that if it's very dark or it comes out dark, then that's going to be a problem, I suppose. What shade? Yeah. I, I, I suppose so. So, but there's two things that we need to consider there. Not only colour, but I think also um, class. I think class plays an issue in this as well. So it's class and race, and that just makes it something like an inferno gone mad at at the top of royalty there. You know what I'm saying to you? But Ray, who said it? Can I what? But who said it? I think think that's a bit silly to try and speculate. And uh, that's like putting a needle in a haystack and trying to pick one out because there are a number of people in the royal family who could have said it and um i don't think it's our position here to um even debate that all right reggie let's move on so (laughs) um big this is this is actually you know this is a legend has actually transitioned over to the the other side and when i say if this gentleman didn't have an impact on street sounds then I'll slip my wrist. I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't be so think, but I, I would say that. Louis, Lou Oten, inventor of the cassette tape. This hey. gentleman was the man who invented the cassette tape. And I don't know how many of us would not have enjoyed our music if it wasn't for this gentleman here. Um, I think he, he invented it in 1963. Yep. Um, and it was a collaboration um, I think it, it was Phillips that he Two Phillips, yeah, Phillips into the into a collaboration with Sony. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I have so many memories on a cassette tape. I still have the cassette tape. Some of our younger viewers won't even know what that is. Um, yeah. You know, but, and the pencil or, or, or the pen. I mean, you, you know, I've always got a story. So I did a, um, a cassette tape mixtape, you know, budding young DJ uh, in my um, primary school years. And um, I did this mixtape for a um, lady who I, uh, a, a, la- a girl who I fancied, um, and you know, really, 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 really had a crush on. Did the cassette tape, gave it to her, Ghost. and sadly she rejected Ghost. me. I asked her out, and she said no, and that was it. That's because you gave her a corner shop cassette. You <laughs> didn't actually buy her a, a Memorex or a TDK. You see, mm. there's a difference, Rich. <laughs> yeah. If you are yeah. kind of fruit, you know. Um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Kind of frugal, frugal, tight fisted. That's the word, frugal, <laughs> frugal with, with your money. Well, yeah. pocket money. Not all of us uh, had had the opportunity to have yellow bags lying around the house with cash, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and he also TDK invented was, TDK was the fake, though. Yes, I think if I remember rightly, it wasn't a TDK. I think it was really, really cheap cassette tape that I got from uh, Woolworths. Oh, uh, at you the see, time, I told you, um, and he also, he also invented the CD in 1980. Um, he was also so he is a big deal for us, so yes. And, the, know, and the, tape, was, the actual tapes are making a comeback, you know, like they're, they're releasing CD, vinyl, and cassettes as well now. So, ka-ching for you, then, Michael. Yeah, but where, yeah. where are you gonna play that? Do you? I don't know. You know what? I don't know, but there's a obviously there's a market for it because they're re- releasing, re-releasing stuff. It's all employed to get you lot to go back now and buy back cassette tapes. I still got know. mine. I still got my techniques. You'll get, you'll get a blaster. I still got my techniques cassette player. Uh, you know, so uh, it's all good. And I've also got my Sony Walkman still as well. Oh wow! But yes, 
Richard Franklin, TDK, SA90s. Yeah, SA90, that was the one. Yeah, right. that was the tape. But there was a chrome as well, weren't there? There was a chrome one. Yeah, SA, the chrome. SA, yeah. The chrome, which was like, or metal, SA metal or something like that, which was crystal clear quality. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they were about, but they were expensive. Those were the top of the drawer ones, that weren't they? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cassette tapes. And do you remember, I mean, we're talking about cassette tapes. The cassettes that they used to go in, if you remember the big double cassettes, yeah. I remember going, do you remember the name that they had for that, which was a bit disrespectful to black people? I'm not going to say it, but. No, I don't remember it, actually. But do you no. remember what, but, do you remember what, they, what, what like, the name used to be? Oh, you don't remember? It's like, it with a W, but I'll leave it there. Oh. W box, and I'll leave it there. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's what they used to call it back in the day. <laughs> um, I don't know where that come from, but I do remember the big old double cassettes. We used to sit down, play, and break dance to it and pretend that we was in New York break dancing and spinning on your head and all them things to it. You know what I mean? It wasn't really reggae music that was played out of it. Them time mm. they um, a lot of the old e electronic e hip hop. Electro. Yeah. Electro hip hop, even, yeah. Smurf uh, and, and all those kind yeah. of things. And also this week um, uh, uh, in the news, final in, the, in our little news roundup, uh, congratulations to uh, Shawnee B and DJ Ace, um, you know, Shawnee B watches uh, Set the Trend uh, on winning uh, Radio Program of the Year. And also well on to Clara Ampho, who won uh, Best Audio Presenter at the uh, Broadcast Press Guild Awards. So uh, well done to them, guys. Big up Shawnee uh, B. Big, big up Shawnee B. Big up DJ And I remember, B. remember, he came on the podcast after he, after he had done that podcast on BBC One and talked about yes. actually going through the motions and all the emotions that come out when he did that podcast on BBC One Extra. Yeah, and I'm not sure who the panellists were, but well done for them for picking out a very good show because, you know, as you said, Ray, he, he came on and talked about it and we all listened to the show beforehand and it was a very good show. So, you know, I like when the right person wins. So well yeah. done to the panellists and once again, well done to Shawnee B and DJ Ace. And whilst we're on the subject of uh, giving flowers to people, you, we both know, and all of us know that Set the Trend uh, celebrates the street sound culture, and we give uh, flowers to our unsung heroes. And uh, we've got a guest who some may know, some of you may not know. Before we do that, Rich. Yeah, go on. We do that, we've forgotten, and we need to do this to make sure we get it in early. We're going to say a big, happy pre Mother's Day to all the mothers that are out there. Um, you know, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. for what you've brought through and you've brought through life. So big up all the mothers that are in the chat. We're celebrating Mother's Day now, even though it doesn't start at 12 o'clock. So big up to all the mothers that are in the chat. Um, thank you very much on behalf of the lads. Sorry, Reg, I just thought we just had to do that. Yeah, okay. So um, like I was saying, uh, he's a big influential figurehead in the uh, UK music industry, uh, bringing us some of your favorite artists uh, to the forefront from DJing and working for the iconic Blues and Soul magazine to uh, holding positions such as uh, head of marketing at Virgin, uh, at Sleeping Bag Records as a promo person. Um, also Motown as well. He was also vice president of um, in various roles at BMG Music, Sony Music UK and Sony BMG UK. Uh, please welcome, be upstanding. We're honored to welcome our ex esteemed Guest on Set the Trend tonight, the legend that is Mervyn Lynn. Put up, put up, put up. Big dog is in the building. Yeah. What's going on, Merv? Hello, you're, far too, you're far too kind, young Reginald. <laughs> <laughs> He's calling me by my government name. Oh my god, I'm not, I'm not working for you. I'm not working for you now, Merv. <laughs> this is the guy who how you all. Uh, yeah, not too bad. <laughs> Uh, so, Merv, thank you very much for joining us here at Set the Trend podcast. You're really welcome. Thank it. you for inviting me. Sorry, I said thank you for inviting me. No, no problem. That's you know, I mean, you've had a great career. I mean, you know, I would love to have a career like yours. Um, I'd like to say I'm still having it, but you carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's he pinched off yet, mate. He's, he's still getting strong. <laughs> so, exactly. So uh, let's start at Blues and Soul magazine, Merv. Um, you know, how did you get get your love for music? And uh, is that what got you 
into such an iconic music magazine at the time, the Legendary Blues and Soul? Yeah, I guess I guess um, when I was going to school, um, there were no opportunities for somebody like me who was interested in marketing or interested in being in the music business. So um, I kind of left school thinking, oh my God, you know, you know, what am I going to do? And my father was very, very strict. And my father had me do an apprenticeship in engineering, which I absolutely hated. Um, and uh, on the day I finished my city and gills, I resigned and I went home and told him I was going to get into the music business. And he laughed and said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not quite sure yet. But I'm going to do something. And a little while later, I got a job working in a record shop. But I was still, I was DJing back in the days and, and doing very well at DJ, DJ about five or six nights a week. So Ooh. going up and down to Blues and Soul, telling them, you know, of the events that I was doing and such like. So it wasn't uh, such a surprise that after about two or three years in a record shop, you know, um, I think Pete Tong left, um, Ralph T left, and, and the guys at Blues and Soul said, you know, there's a desk for you. Um, wow. Would you like to come? And I said, oh, hell yeah. And... Uh, I, you know, I was at Blues and Soul working with, you know, Mark Webster and Bob Kilburn and the um, and the great John Hassan the rest of Soul, um, and it was it was it was a, it was an amazing place to be, and it was, you know, it was the magazine of of you know soul music. So, so Merv, when you when you say you know you was in you know you was leaving school, you didn't want to be in a band, you you know, you, was you was you a musician? Did you, did you play any instruments? Anything like that? I play the piano very badly. Me <laughs> <laughs> too. But and, 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 and clearly, Michael, you you have not heard me sing. So okay. <laughs> but, uh, I, was always gonna be, I was always going to be the other side of the desk. Okay. <laughs> certainly Merv, not the microphone. Merv, what school was that, and what area was that? Was was, was oh, it's a school called Albany in Enfield. And if, if I, um, funny enough, I went back there about two years ago. I did a talk um, to some of the kids about you know careers. Um, opportunities and, to, and just to let them know that you know there are there are things that jobs that are available that um, that are perhaps not something that they look at. So I went back to talk to my old school, which is now an academy, but back in the day it was a uh, it was a very 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 big comprehensive school. And hopefully we're going to talk a lot more about the uh, uh, philanthropy, philanthropy that you've been doing and also cherry work later on as well. We'll get into that. Um, uh, so you left. Um, um, you also another thing I wanted to say at the time when you were DJing, um, Southport Weekender. Now we're not talking about. We've got a Southport Weekender which we did, and rest in peace to uh, Mikey who did the RMP Weekender. But the one which was put on by Alex Lowe's. How did you um, get involved into the formation of Southport Weekender? Oh my goodness. Um, well, so I started, it's funny because I started at Blues and Soul and um, one of the things uh, John Hashin just said was, you know, we've got all these DJs up and down the country that, you know, put in their, 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 their playlists and, and stuff and, you know, we really need to go and check them out in some of the areas. So I said, okay, I'll find. So I did, a, I did a road trip, you know, I went up and I went and spent some time in Nottingham with Graham Park he was DJing at a place called The Garage. And I remember seeing Graham's playlist come through every week. And I thought, my God, this guy's a really hot DJ. I have to go and see him. So I went to The Garage. I, we got on, I got on really well with Graham. Ended up sleeping on his couch that night. And then I continued my journey up. And I ended up in, um, in Newcastle. And I stayed at a place in Jesmond, I remember. And, and Alex was a loser soul correspondent up there. So Alex came yeah. and picked me and took me around all the clubs and and he was DJing and I and it was it was really quite an amazing scene up there and on the Sunday night we went to a place called the Tall Trees in Yarm I met some really good friends who are still really really good friends of mine now and um, and then I came back the other way went to Manchester hung out with Mike Pickering at the Hacienda and and uh, went to a place called the Playpen um, which was uh, big in Manchester at the time, and then came back down, went to Exeter, spent some time with a guy called um, Chris Dennis, and then back to London. And um, and then it was, I guess, Caster. And I remember all the friends that I'd made up in, in Newcastle came to Caster with Alex. And uh, uh, and, that's a, and I, because I did the journey, I know it's a bloody long way. And I said to Alex, I said, to Alex I said, you, you know, there must be about 20 or so of them that come down. I said, 
you know, I said, you've got enough of a scene up there to do your own weekend. Why don't you do your own weekend? And um, he said, well, you know, do you think we could? And I said, I absolutely think you could. And uh, to which he organised the Berwick upon Tweed, which was the very, very, very first, um, you know, the formation of the, the Southport, uh, Southport weekend. Uh, and Mark Webster and I, who were Blues and Soul at the time, we did the program. We we wrote and um, so the advertising of the program, and and it, and it expanded. The first one wasn't quite what Alex expected, but then he um he, he, he you know we talked and I'm a marketeer. That's my background, and I think marketeers are problem solvers. Yeah. And so Alex said, you know, you know this worked and that worked and this worked. He said, but it was it was all um you know a, a bit expensive. And um, and I said, what was expensive? And he said, what, the laminates and this and that. And the, and I said, well, why don't you sell advertising on the back of the laminates, which was the first ever sale of the advertising space on the back of a weekend of laminate, um, which took care of that cost for Alex, which, um, which, um, which I guess everybody else followed after. Which set, set your... Yeah, you set the trend for that. <laughs> wow, that is amazing. Amazing. So, and also... So sorry, Merv, just to go, just to ask you about Blues and Soul, because a lot of people might not know what Blues and Soul was. So could you just explain a bit about Blues and Soul magazine and what that was? Right, Blues and Soul was the foremost um, kind of a, a, a bi-weekly, um, uh, I want to say soul music, but it covered a lot more than that, black mm -hmm. music magazine. Um, it was edited by a guy called Bob Kilburn who used to be head of press, I think, at EMI back in the day. But Bob was absolutely amazing. It was the, it was the Bible of mm -hmm. black music. Uh, yeah, it covered yeah. every, had really in-depth, it wasn't, it wasn't like throwaway things. It was, had in-depth um, uh, interviews with artists. And as a result of that, the artists really wanted to make sure that Blues and Soul was on their agenda when it came to doing interviews. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd have people like Luther Van Dross who, you know, who would absolutely stipulate that he wanted to do a Blues and Soul interview or a Stevie Wonder. And then we started moving into fans of soul music, like people like, um, you know, Steve Davis, the sneaker player, who's a huge, huge, you know, jazz music fan, you know. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it was it was the Bible. Between Blues and Soul and Black Echoes, it covered um, everything to do with black music on that. And some of those, some of those early editions of Blues and Soul magazine now is like they're collectors' items. Oh yes, they go for like people want people want early editions, and you know it's very hard to get hold of. And there was some amazing journalists like David Nathan, who uh, who's around, who um, was based in Los Angeles. You know, um, John Abbey, who um, started Ichiban Records. Um, you know, he was. You know, they were just formidable, formidable journalists. And um, and there were really cool DJs as well who did who did kind of like topical um, 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 topical um, uh, stories as well. So my phone's making noises at me. I don't know why. <laughs> Another one of your friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Definitely, Blues and Soul is like a you know a fantastic magazine. And as I said, you know, I use it for research. It's you know every everyone who's in soul, who's into soul music has been inside Blues and Soul magazine over the years. And it was, it was an absolute um, blast to be there. I mean, Mark Webster and I used to go clubbing. Um, in, Mark lived in Ashford and I lived in Enfield. And uh, we'd go clubbing. And um, I remember coming back at, you know, I think Tim Westwood used to do, because we were in Parade Street and Tim Westwood used to DJ down Parade Street. But his, his, his dude would finish at about 3.30 in the morning and it's kind of like, there's absolutely no way you're going to go, go home and come back. And it was like, it was on school day as well. So Mark and I would end up sleeping on our desk because there were no sofas in the Blues and Soul office. We actually moved <laughs> and we slept on the desk. It was great. <laughs> That's crazy. So also another thing that you set the trend with is um, a little birdie told me that you might have had a part in um, the legendary institution um, for house music, Hacienda, in the UK. Well, yeah, it was on, it was on that same journey that I met, uh, you know, Graham Parkey uh, uh, in Nottingham, and he was, you know, he's an absolute amazing mixer, you know, and still is. 
And uh, I remember coming back down and, and seeing like Mike Pippen, and I said to Mike, I said, I just seen the wildest DJ in Nottingham, a guy mm. called Graham Park. You two should hook up. And then I guess I don't know if it, it was that specific conversation, but certainly it wasn't long after that they got together and, and became, you know, the, the the DJs of the Hacienda. Wicked. So, and for those who don't know, Hacienda is one of the iconic house venues for house music up there in Manchester. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Mervyn Lynn played the part and made it happen. Talk about set the trend. Uh, <laughs> you, okay, so you went from blues and soul to Virgin Records, or did you go to, uh, was it Sleeping Bag Records you went to first? No, 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 I was, uh, I was at Blues and Soul, and uh, I had a call one time from a guy called Chris Griffin, who, uh, no, yeah, Chris Griffin, who was head of promotions. At Virgin, and he uh, he called and and said, "Would I be interested in coming to work at, at Virgin?" So I put my hand on the phone. And said, Absolutely yes. <laughs> what was that? What yeah. role did he offer you? Uh, I, I was um, head of Black Music Promotions, and um, uh, it, it was it was a time when I guess everybody Blues and Soul was a stepping stone for everybody going into the music. Like Tommy had gone on to London Records and. Um, and it was kind of, it was like, a, I guess, a, a, a breeding ground, for want of a better term. So, um, so I went to, I went to Virgin, and we had a really good, strong black music roster. You know, Lou Sands, Carol Thompson, Maxi Priest, you know, Mantronics, um, and then as the, you know, towards my latter years, there it was Soul to Soul in the city. You know, it was, it was, it was a, it, you know, it was a formidable label, and. Um, yeah, and one of the artists that we worked through um, through Virgin was Mantronics and and uh, Tina Rock, who was signed to a, la a little label out of um, America called Sleeping Bag Records. So when Sleeping Bags decided that they wanted to set up, set up a European office, mm. they asked me if I if I'd run it, and I said hell yeah. So I left from Virgin to Sleeping Bag. And so Joyce Sims also was part of Sleeping Bag Records. Joyce Sims, EPMD, Todd Terry. To the Batmobile, let's go. Is a Todd Terry record on Sleeping Bag. Wow, wow, wow! So these are some of the hits that kind of like the early days that we made uh, yeah, stuff. But like that. Yeah, but Reggie, Mantronics must have been one of the. What about EPMD? So what you saying? That's what yeah. you saying? <laughs> yeah. to have your love baseline. I remember those tracks back in the day. Yeah. Look, I'm intrigued to you know, loose ends is like one of you know all time favorites. You know. How did you how did you work with them? What did you what you know? How was it like working with Loose Ends? So we worked uh, Loose Ends with, with a guy who's sadly no longer with us, a guy called Erskine Thompson, who was who was like kind of the foremost black music. Um, I, I, I want to say promoters uh, in terms of promoting music, not a club and, and, a, and a live music promoter, but he was like a mover and a shaker. And uh, you know, Irving, I mean, um, Erskine could pull, pull um, things out of the hat. He could call, you know, pirate radio stations back back then, and you know, and, and so loose ends were very, very cool and very credible always. But at the same time, they were signed to MCA Records in America, through you know, with Gerald Busby. It's, it's quite ironic because Jane mentioned uh, Jane Eugene's post up today on Facebook that it was Gerald's birthday today. Nice. Gerald Busby was the, you know, the uh, head Motown. of the music MCA who went on to be the president of Motown is when I met him. And um, yeah, so loose ends were always very, very, very cool, but popular. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. I mean, listen, Merv, so far we haven't even scratched the surface and uh, you've been involved in so many iconic things. And talking about Motown, the uh, label that founded um, uh, founded by um, Barry Gordy in Detroit, you know, what 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 was your experience like there? Um, so I took over head of marketing for Motown. Uh, I think ninety, maybe ninety, nineteen ninety, something like that. And to be quite honest, there was very few frontline artists coming through. It was pretty much a catalog label at that, at that point. Um, and um, one of the things that you know that, that Motown had said to me from Los Angeles were that we needed to break some frontline artists. You know, we really needed to to keep Motown and contemporary, and to keep it you know it, you know popular. So um, so there were two two artists I think at the time that were 
real kind of focus artists for me. One was uh, a young girl called Shanice. Mm -hmm. and, um, we, we kind of... Yeah, the monster hit her, with that one, didn't you? Taylor, Taylor made her for, I guess, the, the, you know, the global market with a, with a song called I Love Your Smile, which was a hit everywhere. Oh, yeah. um, and, then the, the, and then the biggest uh, project, I guess, was Boys to Men who were being worked and had been worked for about a year prior before I came. Um, but there was a lot wrong with it. The imaging was wrong. The, mm. the sound was a little bit not quite right for a European audience. So we kind of stripped it back and uh, I, I instructed a new photo shoot. So I think you'll see from the, the American version of the album and the, the, the kind of the international version of the album are two very, very different albums. We you know, we clearly wanted to have the image of the, their faces mm -hmm. on the cover. We wanted to show that prep style so you could actually see that they're wearing like jackets and shirts and ties and stuff like that. So it was kind of the whole style thing had to come through. Mm -hmm. and, and then we were, we were, I guess, lucky enough that by the time I came to put out the international album, there were quite a few mixes of some of the hits prior. So we put yeah. out the national album that had mixes of, you know, simping or whatever. Um, and then I got Steve Jervier to remix Motown Philly, which was okay. the, which was the first single. And then and then after that came End of the Road, which was the beginning so, of the road as far as they were. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been involved in one of the biggest groups that we play. I remember playing End of the Road at the time and the ladies used to go crazy for it. I, mm -hmm. I spent I spent so much time on the road with the guys. I know every line of that song, and I even know what moves to make when they come in. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, it's, it's great to have a fascinating insight into the marketing process and the way that you spoke about that, um, uh, you know, the stuff that you did at Motown. And then you went back to BMG Records. Yeah, so Motown was sold to Universal, mm -hmm. and it was obvious that they, to me anyway, that, you know, that the frontline stuff wasn't, their focus, their focus was like, you know, to me, like another Marvin Gaye's greatest hits or Dino Arstella. And yeah. it's kind of like actually the only kind of, you know, I think just prior to that, we did, we had a huge hit with um, a Temptations record, The Joneses, which I got Ray Hayden, oh, yeah. Bob Jones to remix for me. Um, and The Joneses, which was like, that, it was the first kind of top 20 record The Temptations had had in a long time. But it yeah. was clear that that wasn't going to be the focus of Universal going forward. And so I was kind of um, let go. And pretty much straight away, I was asked to come back to, to BMG and, um, and, and, and look after some of, I guess, the most iconic contemporary black music artists of the, of the time. And uh, talking about BMG, before we dig into it, we have got somebody, one, one your first of your friends, who uh, worked with you at BMG, the legendary June Sarpong. June? Uh -huh. about I, it, this is so past my bedtime, guys. You <laughs> 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 start the show at 10.30 at night. I feel, privileged. I feel privileged to see you in that robe or whatever you want to call it, June. Yeah. But it's, it's Mervyn and obviously it's you guys, so I couldn't say no. So here Welcome we go. to sit with him, June. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. It's, yeah, it's welcome. been forever. Oh, my God. It's been so long. <laughs> Indeed, and, and welcome to the uh, home of Street Sound Culture, which is a podcast we've been doing for a while, um, and just documenting the uh, Street Sound Culture, and obviously yeah. Merv was part of it, and yourself as well. Um, yeah. June, I'm loving the word of mouth backdrop behind you, Reggie. I said that too, oh. June. Yeah. Oh, branding. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, June, what was it like working with Mervin at BMG, and how did that come about between you guys? Yeah, so it's a, I don't even know if Mervyn remembers this story, but it's a funny story. So basically what had happened was I had been working at KISS before and um, I had gone for a different job at BMG and uh, Michelle Campbell, who used to work alongside Merv, uh, who was a plugger at the time there, um, interviewed me and I didn't get the job and I never knew why I didn't get the job. And then a year later... Um, 
uh, a job came up with Mervyn. And so I went for the interview um, and I got the job. Um, and then I later found out the reason I didn't get the first one was because I didn't drive and they needed somebody that could drive and the company wasn't prepared uh. to driving lessons. And Michelle Campbell had said to Mervyn when he was hiring, um, there's this girl at Kiss. I'm not telling you who to hire, but I'm telling you who to hire. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, he was an extraordinary boss. I mean, you know, I was probably not the world's best PA. Um, and uh, he still nurtured and developed me. And I would spend my afternoon just singing all day, singing really badly, by the way. <laughs> Um, in the office. <laughs> well, so I know. I know what you're going to say next. You're going to say what you and Jamie used to say when I tell her. I say. Oh, I was going to say that. Yeah, so I would sing all day, really, really badly, and then Mervyn uh, would get annoyed after a while. He'd be like, "Shut up!" <laughs> what was your title um, when you was working there? What did you come what in? What was at? my title? I was like junior something, junior, oh. junior record promotions or something. I can't. Remember. <laughs> I can't remember back then. I can't remember. So you like, had some great times. Um, uh, did Merv ever send you for um, lattes or Irish moss? No, 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 no. Uh, it was, but no, we were in the middle of Putney, so it was before the coffee shop craze, yeah. and. There were no Caribbean shops close by where we were. Um, so it was just teas in the office, really. You know, yeah. I, I was never that kind of boss, and I don't really drink tons of tea, to be honest with you. No. Um, I was more, I'd, uh, I'd like to think I was a lot more inclusive than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually, I, I have another funny story for you. So he, bless Mervyn Lynn. So while I was working for him, I got, my, I got a job at MTV, so I you know, got this life-changing job um, on TV at MTV. And he kindly let me take a day off a week to go and film and didn't dock my pay. Uh. And now <laughs> he allowed me to do both jobs until MTV was much more sort of secure and solid. Um, and then I was able to leave. But, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's helped many people along the way. Yeah, June, you've, you've gone on to. Oh, sorry, Rich, you going in? Go on, Rich. No, I just said the supportive boss. Oh, amazing! Yeah, yeah, great. June, boss. You've gone on to have a, a lovely career. Um, you know, from strength to strength. What have you learned from Mervyn that you've taken into your career to make go up? What have you learned from him? Well, I think one of the, I mean, I learned so much from him, but I think one of the things that I learned was he was just really kind to people anybody from the receptionist right through to the owner of the label uh treated everybody the same so as a result you know no one really says no to merv because you know he's just so kind and generous with his time and 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 also he really cares about the next generation and nurturing talent and has always been that way so um i think that's what i learned from him so did you work for the company or did you work for Mervyn? I worked for the company, but Mervyn obviously was my boss. Because you know sometimes like when you work for a company, you would only be at the company if it wasn't if it, if it wasn't for your line manager or your boss. You really are working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, then yeah, then I worked for Mervyn. Yeah. Uh. And <laughs> unfortunately for me, I got to leave before he did. I mean, if he had left, then I would have gone. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to leave before he did, so we were all right on that front. <laughs> and now you've gone on to bigger things. Um, you know, uh, this is just amazing. Like, director of diversity at the BBC. Did you ever think back then? Native you know, diversity. Let's get sorry, it right. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Uh, um, did you ever think, like, you know, sitting there uh, at Kiss and then also obviously being at BMG, you would be in such a position where you're helping to bring, you know, the entire black diversity, Asian diversity into such a big institution? Well, I mean, I, I, I never know. I never th thought of that. And this, this was definitely not a, a career path of mine. I never thought, you know, in, in those terms, it, it kind of just naturally happened. 
Um, but for me, I think it's a it's just an absolute um, pleasure um, and an honor because obviously I know what the issues are within our industry. I've faced them myself firsthand. Um, so to be in a position to be able to hopefully uh, help level the flame, playing field a bit um, is, yeah, I love it. It's really good. So, um, Merv, oh, sorry. June, you've got a book coming out in May, which is called The Only One in the Room. Oh, it's next year now. I've, yeah. I've, been, I've been so, my publisher's so annoyed with me because I literally haven't written anything. <laughs> <laughs> and it was supposed to be coming out this year. Um, I so, think that, so, that title um, kind of suits you because you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're the most senior person at the BBC now. Um, senior right, black person, black. I think. I think so. Maybe I don't know, but yeah. uh, but I'm. I mean, I'm on the executive committee. So and, um, and um, being black and, and being a woman, what challenges does that bring to you in that environment? Well, I think actually what it brings is is not challenges. I think what it brings is an, an additional aspect, um, an aspect that hasn't been there up until now, um, at, at the executive committee level anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I don't see it as a challenge. And I, and I see that, you know, I see it as it's important to have my perspective in the room because you need that diversity of thought. And there are ways that I can see things that perhaps some of the others might not just because of um, my lived experience. So yeah, I see it as a bonus. So Merv, are you really, really, really proud to uh, see what June has achieved and uh, done so far? Well, obviously you're gonna say yes. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> every, day, every day, every day she brings a smile to my face for what mm. she does um, and what she keeps doing. I mean, she is she is so honest and straight, and you know what you see with June is what you get, and that's that's always been the case. And um, it was no surprise to me that she's gone this far, and she's still going. It's uh, it's amazing. Wicked. Well, June, thank you very much for being on the. Oh, Sorry. thank you, Reggie. You know, thank you. Thank all you. Other I mean, we are here, we've been doing this for about a year and a half, the home of the street sound culture and stuff like that. So anything you need, you know, we're here to support. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean, you know? Just we've got the other Jim, what was your favorite, what was your favorite artist that we worked in your time? Oh, well, the one and only Angie Stone, and I hear she's coming in. Oh, <laughs> send her my love, please. <laughs> I, I ordered many a taxi and many a flight. But... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks okay. so much, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Merv? How it, Merv, how does it feel? Um, because one of what one of the main things that a manager has to be doing, like to my mind, is bringing through talent and making the talent have an opportunity, and you know, to build that platform for them to shine. How does it feel for you to see June now um, where she is? Well, um, a couple of things on that. One is, I remember hearing on one of your podcasts somebody said that I didn't care about the next generation and I only cared about myself, which. I've never forgiven you guys for. And second of all, and second of all, is that actually everybody that I've ever uh, has ever worked for me, uh, uh, they've all gone on to either run their own businesses or you know, or, or or do what June's doing. You know, Jennifer Mills has got her own company. Jamie Topman's got his own company. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like actually, what I, what I'd like to you know, if if and when I die. I'd like my legacy to be that actually he gave everybody a chance, and um, and and I stand by that. Yeah, hundred percent. And I have to say, I mean, you know, when uh, Sony Music were merging with BMG, I remember being nervous as hell going in to go and see Merv about um, trying to uh, work out some kind of uh, uh, deal regarding the street team, and you know, Merv was sitting there. He was thinking, I think, oh my god, I bet you, I'm, I'm out the door. That's it. I'm, I'm going to lose this Sony account. But you know, Merv came up with a great solution. He came up with a great um, idea, which was to say, "Look, you know what? Let's put you and Reds at the time together. Why? Why would you have one person when I can have two? So we managed to work it out. So I will give um, 
Merv, that props 100%. You know, yep. if it wasn't for Merv, I wouldn't be under the Sony BMG wing but and Merv, have that experience. Yeah, when we talk about the street team, though, I mean, that's very important. So let's put that in context so everybody understands. Um, before you were in place, there was no street team in no record company, as far as I'm aware of. Um, that contact, that direct contact between street sounds like us, the Fifth Avenues, the Lakes Editions, the Desi G, the Barry Whites, um, the company Soul Sounds, all those street kind of sounds that was out there at the time and the younger ones, um, there was no direct contact between ourselves and the record company. Every record that we probably bought, we would have went to a record shop and we would have probably got the import or a promo or someone who had a contact in America who brought over tunes. There was no real direct contact with that. How did the street team idea come along for the UK? So, uh, so when I went back to BMG, when they, um, there was a number of labels coming through at the time, Rowdy Records, which was Dallas, Dallas's label, um, a Puffy had Bad Boy, and there were quite a few kind of urban type records coming through the face. So I made it my mission to go to America and spend some time with Dallas. And I spent a whole day with Puffy actually, you know, while he did, you know, his day to day business. I, I sat there watching him kind of, you know, approve a video shoot and, and like listen to, you know, listen to masters, um, uh, do some styling and talk to me. And uh, one of the things that we were talking about was how difficult it was to play black, break black music in, a, in the UK <clears throat> without Radio One. And, um, and then we we talked about how he had you know uh, had this uh, you know amazing bad boy street team you know that you know that were everywhere and I took that idea back I took that, back, that idea back to London uh, I got uh, I had Jamie Topham who was working for me at the time and I, I gave Jamie the opportunity to go and kind of recruit these guys that would <clears throat> that would be our voice on the street you know um, um, you know we'd give them you know, the opportunity to be the the guys in their area, you know, by having the latest tunes, you know, the bad boy, you know, merchandise or the word of mouth. I called I called the whole street area word of mouth because it was very much word of mouth. And a lot of times I was told that, you know, this record was going to be difficult or Radio 1. Well, I said, well, fine. You know, I'll put it to the word of mouth street team. And that was how we built the energy and built the demand. And a lot of times it, records grew out of that independent of Radio 1. In fact, a lot of times we had Radio 1 after we charted because we charted so high. So that was the power of kind of like the street sounds, the power radio stations that yeah. was starting those records? Absolutely, 100%. Wow. Wow. You know, artists, artists and songs like um, Anthony Hamilton's Everybody came out of that very, very stream. You know, it, you know, it didn't have any radio. It came from... You know, it came from the street. It came from. Ronald the... Jones, you you know yeah. what's up. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Exactly. And 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 we got an other um artist who definitely came from the street sound scene, and uh, you know the her written music and records. Um, another one of your friends, Angie Stone, in the building. Whoa. <laughs> Let me see. Hey, what's up, what's up man? Man? <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I'm blessed. I cannot I complain. This is amazing. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, just so all of the people there can see and know the way I truly feel about my entire career, not just this monumental guy right here that made it happen. Merv, you are amazing. You changed my life. I couldn't get a record deal in the States. I came to the UK, uh, I had done some demos for a friend of mine. And of course I had worked on my own record and uh, lo and behold, with, you know, cut to the chase, they got a hold to my record, uh, but was told it was the demos record from somebody else. Okay. Of course, when, when I get over there, they want me to come over there because they want to sign me. I'm like, huh? What are you talking about? I mean, and Merv set me down in a room because I was like, I, I'm not in a group. I, 
got ideas for, you know, uh, 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 to put us on a couple of records and blah, 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 blah. And he's like, no, I don't think you understand. You know, we really, really want, what can we do to get you? So along with uh, BMG and a lot of the cast that really believed in me, June as well. Thank you, June. She was working very closely with the project uh, when I went to the UK. They handedly like snatched me over uh, to the UK and I said, Ooh. Oh, she's going out. Should we be back? Yeah, yeah should be yeah. back. <laughs> I think uh, the Wi Fi up there. So, is, I mean, um, when we're talking Angie Stone, um, uh, uh, the streets actually, the street sounds love that two step, that classic soul vibe and music. Um, did you know? Did you know that we was going to embrace it? Did you have that feeling from hearing her demos that this was going to be? hit for, for, for the streets and that you could build it from the streets? Well, one of the things I've always said in terms of marketing, you know, certainly marketing black music uh, uh, is, is actually we know a lot more about where things come from and why they come from where they come from because we've lived that. We've lived that life. And when I heard Angie for the first time, I was listening to, you know, these 20-year-old, you know, girls telling me about love and living and, you know, and separation. I'm thinking, what do you know? 20 years old for Christ's sake and then all of a sudden Angie came and, you know and there's an honesty and a belief in every word that comes out of her mouth and it's kind of like it's a lived life and that's I thought you know if it touches me here it's got to touch you know the wow. scene that came from there too. One of the biggest tracks for us as a street sounds and we totally fell in love with it the first time we heard it me... was No More Rain. Mm. Um, that is just a classic song Angie we just so love that. Uh, our, our internet's going. Yeah. Let me. Can you hear me? Can you? We can hey, hear you. Can you guys, hear me. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you see yeah. me? I'll, yeah. Yeah. No, you're, what, what, what you're breaking going up. On, but I'll say this. I will say this. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 yeah we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. The Wi Fi is a bit slow, isn't it? Okay. Uh, Merv, Merv uh, took, the, took the reins uh, to sign Angie Stone, and we went out with the other cat. Uh, and what amazingly happened is, of course, No More Rain blew up and went crazy. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. the people over at in the States are like, wait a minute, it comes to us. After all this great work, his team had done to really get Angie Stone where she needed to be. Of course, the Clive Davis of the industry, they wanted to come back and say, no, she belongs to us. I was actually the, the last artist on the label in the, the you it, to consider. Uh, everybody was dropping uh, music, DLC. I mean, you name it, they were dropping records left and right. And it was like, well, we'll get to her in a minute. And I was sitting with an afro with my head waiting on my turn. And when <laughs> Mervyn and them said, hey, we love her, they broke that record. And I think Lauren Hill was out at the time and automatically we were compared together. It was an amazing time. And I want to single-handedly thank you for understanding and giving me through. So when that time comes, when we have to honor the person who's really responsible for Angie Stone, it's that man right there, Mervyn Land, along with his team over at Sony BMG that took a chance. Wow. Wow. Ah, oh, she's frozen. Oh, I, she's fro I think she's frozen. Yeah, she's frozen. Okay, so I mean, while I was waiting for her, um, to sort out, we're going to speak to the producers and uh, get 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 it all sorted. Um, uh, I believe we have another friend of yours, Merv, Mr. Ivan Mateus. Oh, okay. Ivan Mateus. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Oh, my brother. What happened? <laughs> um, uh, first, I want to say, um, uh, uh, I got to brag on Angie for a minute. Um, when I was first trying to break into the industry before I had a cut, before I had anything. 
I used to hang out around um, MCA where she was signed as, as a writer. Mm -hmm. And she took me under her wing when I didn't have a cut. I, 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 as a, when I was a teenager, I was signed to Atlantic to a group briefly that didn't work. And I was just hanging around the industry trying to get in. And um, Angie took me under her wing. She used to come to the projects in Coney Island where I live, which is like the public housing. And she would pick me up and drive two hours back to Jersey to her house so that we could record demos. And then she would drive back two hours and drop me off. So mm -hmm. she did that. And, and the crazy part is, 10 years later, um, I wound up writing and producing one of her biggest hits, Wish I Didn't Miss You. Mm -hmm. um, so it all came full circle. And it, 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 she is, uh, we talk about Merv, but she's another one that has created opportunities for people and she supports um, up and coming uh, artists. And she, she has an eye, you know what I mean? Because she knew I was gonna be something before I knew I was gonna be something. She did it with D'Angelo and so many other people. So shout out to Angie and um, it, it came back and I'm, I'm, I'm just blessed and, 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 and honored to have been able to return the favor and work with her and uh, contribute to her legacy and her great um, body of work, so. The, the song I wish I didn't miss you. How did you come up with writing that? Well, it, it was a sample. To be honest, I I did not think that song was gonna be a hit because uh, I, I had a, a songwriting partner, Andrea Martin, and um, we we wrote a lot of songs. You know, we we, we just cranking them out all the time, mm -hmm. and and Andrea kept saying, I, "I love this song. I love this song," and I was like, ah, "So." Uh, we actually sent the song to uh, Clive Davis, and um, and we had been working with him on a bunch of projects. And Andrew was signed there at the time. And um, I called uh, Angie, and she said, "Oh, I'm, I'm finished with my my project already." I said, "I got the song." So um, at the same time, we had sent it to Clive, and Angie said, "Oh, I'm finished with my record." And then two weeks later, Clive calls us and says, "No." Oh, Angie Stone must do this record. <laughs> and so we're like, what? Like, are, are you kidding me? Like, this is this is gonna happen? And then Angie says she heard the song, and before you know, it, she was in the studio recording the record, and and it happened. And before you know it, like, it was like, wow, this is like one of the biggest records. And Angie has a inc an incredible body of work. So to 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 have been able to contribute a hit to that body of work alongside of some of my favorites. Um, my personal favorite of hers was, was Brother, but um, uh, she, to have, you know, and then that one followed up and it was like, it blew up and it was, it was kind of crazy. But I gotta say, Clive did call that record. And the crazy part is every time I would, uh, hey baby girl, how you doing? <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, and obviously, you know, coming being able to finally work with Angie after years of having done demos and things like that early on. That you know, uh, as creative people, we do a ton of work, and the the bulk of it never sees the light of day. You know what I mean? Because you have to create a, a thousand songs to get one through the system. So um, it, it was just a, a a great opportunity, and I'm thankful for it. And um, Angie just put her stank on it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and she made it her own. Listen, and I, I put the stank on it. He's an awesome, awesome producer. And when I was struggling with stuff, he was pushing me very hard to get that record done. And it was the last record that we put on that album. Clive said, hold up, we're not done. We're not done. <laughs> I wanted to be so finished with that album. And I'm like, do we have to do another record? And it ended up being the biggest record on that album. So Ivan, you guys did an amazing job. So yes, and I know it's about Mervyn. I haven't seen this cat since back then. So thank you, sweetie. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was it's, it was actually your your voice and your years of of um, of, of that you put in of, of work that I was able to come in and and have success. On based on what you have already built, so it was my honor. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know uh, that you guys were that close. 
and I know that you and Andrea obviously and stuff like that, but it was. It, I love the circle. I love the full circle. It's amazing. I work, to, to, just to tell you, I work with Angie before I work with Andrea. I actually went to school with Andrea, but we didn't start working until after um, I was already at, um, right. at at Arista, which is where I met you on the playground of Arista almost 30 years ago. Um, wow. 28, 28 years ago. <laughs> and, so, um, so, so, Ivan, what was that meeting about? When you met Mervyn, well, well, I, moved, I moved from um, from New York to to London, and it was like a culture shock because <laughs> um, you know I'm from Brooklyn, New York, from the public housing the projects, and you know I'm, I'm they moved me to Chelsea Harbor, and and I'm used to you know uh, uh, saltfish and plantains and peas and rice, and, and I get there and they're like, would you like some Marmite and stuff to dick? And I'm like, hey, what is this? Like, I don't know what that is, you know what I mean? So um, it was a, a bit of a culture shock. And at that time, there wasn't a huge, the priority artists were considered the pop mainstream artists. Mm -hmm. And so to the credit, to the label's credit, they were trying to move me more pop because that's those were the artists that got the, the bigger budgets, the more attention at the label. But I that wasn't my lane, you know what I mean? And that was where it, it, I was having a little bit of trouble. And when I came in, I was having trouble adjusting. It was a culture shock. And meeting Mervyn, Mervyn was instantly able to connect me to things that felt familiar. He has a, a Caribbean background. I have a Caribbean background. So it was an instant connection and he would you know he, he I learned where to eat I learned you know where the clubs were I learned how to you know what I mean so it was like a he brought me back to a point of familiarity you know what I mean and and taught me how to appreciate London in a completely different way from what I had um had experienced that prior to that I mean I did I was hanging out with Eternal and Michelle Gale I worked with I, you know I toured um with them uh, Dina Carroll that's that's how far back we go and um, it was just a great experience. But the thing about Merv is that um, he was just a great connector. And it was like, you, you just don't, it just, that just doesn't happen. It, it, it developed over years of experience. And it comes from the fact that he had such a wide range of experiences, so many different areas from the DJing, from uh, you know the marketing, from the street team and everything. And it doesn't matter what it was, it was like, okay, um, I need a more flavorful urban, a seasoned stylist, for example, mm. or it was a go-to. He would tell me where to go. You know what I mean? Like every, every, he was the plug to urban America for the UK at a time where there really w weren't many. You know what I mean? It was um, either you were pop or you were considered kind of underground or soul. You know, you'd have to go to these little open mics or these little small clubs. I remember there were artists in America that were huge. And then I would go to the UK and they'd be playing a small little cramped club. You know what I mean? Where it was like, it, it wasn't the same cachet or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, part of what, what in my mind helped shaped, shape the urban scene was Mervyn. I remember when I when I left the UK, I came back. I was having blessed and fortunate to have a string of of, of hits. And every other song I worked on as yet, I worked on um Outcast, I worked on Angie. Every time I turn around, it's like, oh yeah. Merv's working the record in the UK. You know what I mean? So it, it was it <laughs> kind of crazy. I was at when I worked with La Faze, if I worked with Bad Boy, if I worked with Arista, if I worked with J Records, it always came back through and Merv had his hands on breaking the records in, in the UK. So um, thank you not only for um, acclimating me to the UK, but for all the other records that you helped of, of, of my catalog and of my career breaking in that market and expanding the market. And I just want to say that um, for a long time, when I first got to the UK, the um, urban market wasn't what it is now. Urban music is now the pop music and the culture of the globe. It's the global hip hop and urban music and urban culture as a whole is now the dominating force of a genre. And that didn't happen by accident. That happened over decades of people in different territories working it and 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 introducing it to the masses and to the to the general public. And as far as 
where UK is concerned, I can't think of a name that's more um, synonymous with that, with that effort to introduce urban culture and American urban culture and hip hop and, and mainstream um, melanated contributions. I can't think of anybody who I know has had a more of a hand in that than Mervyn. So um, we all owe him uh, for that. Thank you, Mervyn. You're far too kind, Ivan. <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay, if you want to... so we got Andy back. Yes. So, okay, you... so Andy, um, I don't know if she can hear us. Andy, Andy, I, don't, you... I don't know if she can hear us. I don't think she can hear us. I, I don't want yeah. to mess it up. <laughs> she can hear us. <laughs> I can... She can hear. I can hear you. Oh, good, great, good, good, good. So, so... can you hear me? Yes, we can. Just um, yeah, we can. But you can't. You can't. Yeah, we can. We can. We can. What, what, what does it mean for an artist, Angie? To I think I, Ivan was talking his piece, but what did it mean for you to have such a safe pair of hands? Yeah, she can't. I think she's she's freezing, isn't it? Well, my delay. My response is going to be delayed. Mm -hmm. So bear with me because I don't know why this machine is acting. But him having his hands on my project, uh, in my opinion, really helped to shape my entire career. Um, I wouldn't want to do another deal in any other place if Mervyn's not around. Wow. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I decided... Uh, when it was decided that I would be leaving J Records, uh, when I was getting calls from the UK, it's like, if Mervyn is not involved, I don't want to be down. Uh, because he, you know, put the street team together. Everybody was just like clockwork. Everybody did their thing. I remember uh, Macy Gray was the big to-do at the time. And we dropped our record. And we started out selling Macy Gray 9 to 1 like immediately that was merv and what ended up happening ah it's gone again yeah. okay well we, we we are trying we have been trying it, it, it was working all right before also being part of it as well um, we've got a few more things to talk about with Merv. So now let me let me just tell you an Ivan story because this is this is something that um, that I'll never forget, and and and, and it will show you the measure of the man. Um, we uh, his management company uh, had a meeting with Ivan. I was in the meeting. We were talking and um, talking about the direction for Ivan, and and Ivan was very very clear. You know, this is the music he did. This is the direction that he wanted to go, and they were very very pop slanted and were like, you know, trying to say, you know, you need to do this. And, and then I, I would say, no, no, no. You know, this is, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. And this is where I know I'm going. And then they started talking about, you know, the, the, the potential of earnings if you went down a certain route. And I never forget, I will never forget this line and it sticks in my mind. And I even turned around and said to them, he said, he said, I don't need to eat caviar every day, but I'll eat every day. And that has stuck with me for years and years and years and years. And it came out of his mouth and it was a, it's, it's, it's a pivotal moment for me. Great line. Great line. Good way of thinking as well. A lot of things came out of my mouth back then, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was a difficult time because I, I could imagine for Mervin as well because you you you're at a company that um, that is very powerful that has a lot of artists, but the the priority are is not urban uh, based, you know. So you know, trying to trying to find a, a way to convince the higher ups of the value. And there's a certain amount of foresight that has to happen for Mervyn to have uh, been involved so deeply in urban uh, in the urban music scene and to see where it has evolved now and to see the value of it now with, where, the, um, where the record companies didn't really see a value in it before. And they would take urban artists and they would say, you know what, well, we'll prove to you, we value you. We're gonna make you pop. 
you know, and that, that was the that was their idea of, of of respect. You know what I mean? And and to their credit, that was all they knew, you know. But um, so many records have have come through Mervyn. And for for those of you that uh, don't know, I've also written and produced um, uh, "Don't Let Go" for En Vogue. I wrote and produced "Breathe" for Blue Cattrell. I did "You're the One" for SWV. I did. Um, so I, 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 still I, I some checks. You still got some checks. Yeah. <laughs> for a minute, you know what I mean? So um, uh, it was a crazy and part of the frustration, actually, why I left the UK when we finished the record. I said, "This isn't me." I, I met with Clive and uh, Clive Davis. Um, when the record was finished and he said, um, I want you to do a different record for America. And I said, I, I just spent three and a half, four years in the UK making this record I didn't even want to make, you know what I mean? It wasn't even my kind of direction. So I was getting scolded by Clive Davis, the great Clive Davis is scolding me saying, you have to make a new record, this record's all wrong. And I'm saying, I've been saying that for, for you know for almost four years. So I decided to leave and, and come back to America because as I came back um, to America and started doing urban music, it just felt right, you know? And um, it's kind of crazy how I was just cranking out a bunch of songs, uh, you know, and and they wound up right back in, in Mervyn's uh, hands. And I, you know, it was, it was, and it was a good thing because having known him for so long, I knew that my songs were in the best hand and the best shot that they had at being introduced to the European market was through him. So um, I can't I can't stress to you guys enough. And you know, you guys gotta we talk about respecting the culture, you know, Mervyn is the culture when you talk about um, music executives and how urban music became so popular in the mainstream because it was always, like Mervyn said, there was an understanding that the UK had a profound understanding of soul and, and a respect for uh, soul and urban music. And when you hear these old samples, these old soul samples that are rare in the UK, like they are always the fans that could instantly identify them because there was always a respect, but it wasn't on the mainstream, you know what I mean? And so Mervyn helped to usher the 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 underground soul movement and the underground hip hop and urban movement into the mainstream, so um, that's what it is. You know, no. so making me blast. Thank like much, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ivan. Thank you for coming on set. The train. It's been a pleasure, um, and we've learned a lot about your history as well. Thank you for having so much input into our in, into the black culture as well. It, it, it's just great hearing it. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank, thank you so much. No. I, uh, Thank you. Did, did you ever get a chance to work in the US? Um, no, but funny enough, I was offered a job, uh, uh, a company in and around the time of Sony taking over BMG, mm -hmm. and um, and it was it, it, it was a it was a tricky time, and it, the time is just didn't work. Um, um, I was kind of. I, I'd kind of given the other company in America that the, the um, Merv. Yeah. What was it like being? I mean, if we've heard about the role that you played in terms. Sorry, of sorry, sweet vibes. Uh, before you go on, apologies. I got Angie on the phone. She said apologies, um, but she wants to say something. Uh, I hope you guys can hear. Uh, Angie. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry guys. guys. I, 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 I took the back road to because you can't because you can't uh, you can't do going on with the computer and now the phone went dead. I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> I'm not gonna mess this up anymore. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for your input, Mervyn. I will definitely reach out to you when the coast but i wanted to show you love and say thank you you know you're the best and we still got business to do okay it ain't over to the bad lady saying <laughs> thank you angie <laughs> hey, thank you thank you and much success continued success thank you. Wow, what a pity. wow i think i think we got the general consensus there of how much love that she's got for you anyway Mervyn. so mm. Mm -hmm. Actually, start. What I was gonna, what I wanted to ask you about being the lone voice in the room. You, 
I mean, you've held a lot of prominent positions as a black man. How difficult was it for you sometimes as a black man to have those conversations in the room around predominantly maybe a lot of white people who didn't understand the value of black music and how that could be to being a number one? Well, the- to be honest with you, I don't think I ever... I don't think I ever came across uh, a major problem in in justifying a release and justifying, you know, the marketing behind a release that I felt was going anywhere because ultimately you live and die by your last record. And mm-hmm. if your record is strong, you, you, it, it, it's rare that you're going to be challenged on, you know. Uh, Reggie asked me the other day in terms of, you know, why were... Um, why were the budgets so low on black music? <clears throat> and the budgets were only given from forecasting and you forecast, you know, with the sales guys, mm-hmm. how many do you think you're going to sell of this particular record? Mm-hmm. And you're given a percentage of that to market the record. So, you know, if, if you feel gung ho and you say, well, actually I'm going to sell a hundred thousand, then guess what? You'll get a certain amount of money and it's on your head being, you know? So if it doesn't work, the chances of you getting that kind of money on the next one are out the window. But if it does work, it gives you kudos to go in there and say, well, actually that one did well, but you know what? I think this one is going to be an absolute smash. And therefore you're given the latitude then to, to go and market the record in a way that you see fit that, uh, that justifies, you know, the release. The big budget. What kind of artists can, because I don't think we've kind of discussed, we've discussed some of the artists that was on, that was under your name. Um, could you mention some of the other artists that we haven't discussed that was under your wing that you was directly in charge of their release of their of their track? Well, Usher was uh, was one of the main ones. Uh, I remember, I remember the release of "You Make Me Wanna." You know, and "You Make Me Wanna" was, you know, I think it was bubbling in and around, you know, um, street culture for three, maybe four months, maybe five months even. Mm-hmm. And I even had, you know, Trevor Nelson calling me and said, man, you've got to put this record out. And I, and I kept saying to him, I said, it's not ripe enough yet. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's maybe making a big noise where you are. But for me, I needed it to, to cross over into, you know, not just making a big noise. I needed a record that was going to be a number one or number two or number three record. And for that, I needed, I didn't just need to appeal to the, to the major cosmopolitan cities, I needed to, I needed Middle England. I needed, you know, the record to be hot in Gloucestershire in the same way as it is in Middlesbrough, and uh, uh, and and so 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 there are a number of artists like that that you'd have to kind of keep bubbling, and you and 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 oftentimes you're bombarded by, you know, guys like you guys who are like, you've got to get this record out, you've got to get it, yeah. and it's kind of like actually you're only seeing it through your own vision and actually what I'm hearing and I'm, I'm and I was always you know speaking to the sales guys you know is there a demand for that they've been asked for this you know where is it seeped over are we you know are we have we got a record that's hot enough have, have we got a record that's even what was it going to take we, because if we're not going to take it we know we're not going to be a you know a top five record it's kind of like until we get to that point actually yeah. it, 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 it's an urban record and what I wanted to do was to have an urban record that became popular. Uh, Usher, it Usher is one of your one of your personal friends as well, as well as Angie Stone. How did you transfer Usher from a street sound, from a street artist into a big international artist? What did you do to transform him in, into that position? Well, I think I think a lot of a, a, a lot about Usher is about Usher. You know, he's a guy who very, very much believes in himself, and so he should, because he's a phenomenal artist. Um, and he's very, 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 very creative. Um, um, and works hard. He works hard. You know, one of the things, you know, that um, most people don't realise, breaking an artist isn't just about what we do. It's about what the artist does. Mm. And there are some artists that work and work and work. You know, Alicia Keys worked. You know, the first record, of Alicia, she worked 24 hours. I, you know, we went on the road into Europe. You know, she, you know, she she did promo all day. 
She had a piano set up in her room. She wrote all night. She woke up the next day. She did promo all day. We got on the tour bus. We went to the next country or the next city or on the plane. And she worked and she worked and she worked until, you know, the second record came. And she said, I can't do that anymore. And, 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 and I said, well, you know, you, 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 you need to maintain that level because there's, there's a next cat coming through, you know. And if you don't, if you don't, if you're not competing with yourself, you're never going to compete with them. So I remember her saying to me, you know, actually, I don't want to travel into all of Europe. Can't we do a press conference? And I said, a press conference? Oh, my God. You know, a press conference is not good because, you know, because an artist or the journalist doesn't get anything that's unique to them because everybody hears it at the same time. It's kind of like, you know, what's, what's, what's exclusive about it? So she said, you need to figure it out. And um, fortunately, um, June, through June, I met David Lammy. David agreed to, um, to put Alicia into the House of Commons for a press conference. And it was the first time ever an artist had ever, ever, ever played the House of Commons. And this is Alicia Keys we're talking and about. And it caused an uproar, you wouldn't believe. It. <laughs> you know, and and we, I remember, I set it up, there was Alicia at the piano and there were three backing vocalists and that was all. And David had invited some of his uh, constituents from Tottenham. We sat and some girls from a girls' school, they sat in the front row. And, and David absolutely believed, you know, Alicia spoke to his constituents. She was from a single parent family. She was of mixed race heritage, and and but she gave some something for them to aspire to, and um, I had it. And Alicia sat at the piano, and and a bunch of questions. And Alicia walked in and she said, "Look, you know, actually, this is so formal. It's in the House of Commons. You know, it's really not that serious. But you know, is there any questions?" And this woman stood up with the microphone. She said. Hi, Alicia. You may not know, but there's been quite a lot of furore about the fact that an artist is playing in the House of Commons. And um, I'm from BBC Radio 4, and a lot of people are not very happy about that. What do you think? And Alicia started plunking on the piano, ding, 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 and she said, she said, and I wouldn't have put any other artist in that position because she was very, very bright and very articulate. And she just plunked on the piano. She said, she said, I thought we we're in a, we we're in a, in a place where laws are made and and boundaries are pushed. She said, aren't we pushing a boundary today? She says, I know a song about that. And she played a song. And <laughs> and that is another word. But, um, but the point was... Uh, Merv, around that time, was there also, I think, um, which you, which you, I, 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 I presume that you had to sign off as well. She also visited um, a youth club and got onto BBC and ITV news channel at, at, at the time, around that time as well. Do you remember that? So Well, I, I certainly know uh, on the, the performance in the House as a parliament, it made the six o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news, MTV news, mm -hmm. CNN. It was it was a global thing. But always the, always the thing with the street team, I'd say to them, you know, actually, I don't want to disconnect the artists from where they come from. Mm -hmm. so there's always opportunities that the street team will take Usher to a youth club or Tyrese into a school or, you know, there were all these opportunities to kind of not make sure that they're still connected and still kind of uh, are visible in the community where they come from. So um, I, I, I can't remember particularly if there have been so many. Uh, well, you know, yeah. what I like about you is your honesty. Yeah, you're always going to tell the truth. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm for a but, Michael, but you carry on. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question, and, and in true Mervlin spirit, I want you to answer the question. Yeah. Now, I know you're a big golf fan. Yeah. Who is better at golf? You no, 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 or, I don't need to go there. You you or Reggie? Be, you're not going to bring Reggie into the street. It's all about Merv. Oh, look at that. You see? You see? I play with a great Mervlin and Spoonie and you know, and um, Hanson, a Liverpool and legend. And that, and that, and that, you know, I'm ready, ready. Come on, I won't. I won't even answer that. You answer, Reggie. I, I like to say that I'm, I'm, I like to say that I don't get a chance to warm up. Right, me, right, 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 <laughs> the caddy, so you're uh, the caddy, actually. Let, so, let me ask. Right, right. Let me ask a question. Reggie, what's your handicap? 
Um, now, probably 28. <laughs> Merv, what's your handicap? About 22. Ah, Merv's, Merv, Merv's in a better position, Rich. No, it's not 28. It's obviously lower, but yeah. Uh, um, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, Merv, you've got a load of background. Uh, our producers are, yeah. are going crazy. We've got Junior waiting also to come on and do a performance for you. But um, can I just um, highlight, you've got tons of logos in the background there. Tell yeah. us a bit about you know why you've got so many logos there because not only have you given back to um you know a lot of people in the music industry but you've also given back to a lot of charities so please give us some insight into some of the stuff you do from a charitable uh angle okay well, well uh let's start with Morris because that's sitting there Morris Robbins so Morris Robbins is is a is the charity of choice for the the business of music um, they do a number of uh, fundraising events um, that, uh, that involve music therapy. Now, music therapy is a way of reconnecting people with, I uh, guess, mental illness into remembering things or to stimulate speech or interaction in some way. So before, pretty much um, music is such a, such a powerful tool in that respect, you know, um, and I, I always, I always liken it to the to the point when you walk in the kitchen, and you think, well, "What am I coming to the kitchen for?" Yet, if I ask you to sing Bob Marley's Master Blaster jamming, you will know every word. And that record was was out in 1980. And that music has that connection. Music has that ability to open up, you know, memories that are perhaps sometimes lost. So Nora Robbins do a lot of that. My daughter. Is severely handicapped and um, she's lost the power of speech and we use music therapy to reconnect with her in some way. So I do a lot uh, for, me, uh, for them. I'm, I sit on the board of trustees as I do with the AP Foundation, which is, um, which is a charity about rehabilitating ex-offenders, giving them an opportunity to get back into the community, to be of a benefit to the community. Um, we do a lot of courses in prison and out of prison. Um, and I do that um, after a guy called Andrew Pritchard, who was formerly known as the Urban Smuggler. Um, and, uh, and it's Andrew's organization. And I just, uh, I'm chair of board trustees. I just help and guide him to help others. And, and the, 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 also I sit on the board of trustees for Arms Around the Child which is a charity that helps um, children in, in, in the developing world who are uh, parentless. Uh, it actually came out of a charity called Keep a Child Alive, which was mm. Keezy's charity. And, uh, and it, um, Arms Around a Child, we, we, we do the same. We, we fund a lot of projects, orphanages in, in Ghana. We've got school in Ghana, which, um, yeah, we've got school in Ghana. We've got um, uh, one, two, two houses in India, another house in, in South Africa, where we help um, orphan children. Some of them, a lot of them um, have HIV. Wow. Um, and it, sorry. Yeah. And then um, obviously, you know about 56 Black Men and the Black uh, Bridge Network. I help and advise CFAS Williams, who started both of those organizations and I help guide him because um, I'm much older. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, likewise, uh, the Media Music Company, which is an organisation to help um, um, people create, creative people, and it's based in Deptford, and it's run by an amazing woman called Wazzy Brewster, and she's, um, uh, and I help and, and guide, I'm a, you know, music business ambassador. So, yes, my, my whole thing is about giving back to, in, in, in any way I can, and to, like June said, level the playing field, you know, with the UK Diversity Task Force and the BPI Equality and Justice Advisory Group. I helped to try and change the industry that I came from, the industry that I know, to be more inclusive and give, um, you know, pe black people, gay people, white, uh, women, give them more an opportunity to, to go on. That's amazing, Murph. And you know what? I wish we could just talk even longer and, you know, we could be here till 1 a.m. Uh, reminiscing about stories and arguing about golf and stuff like that. But we've got another person, surprise performance for you here today 
I think we've just been waiting for a bit. Please welcome to the stage the amazing uh, Junior Giscom. Where is he, Dan Dada? <laughs> He's got to unmute. He's got to unmute. You're on mute, Junior. <laughs> yeah, somebody unmute Junior. <laughs> He's, he's got his one. Oh, there, oh, there, there you go. Oh, there, there you go. There you go. It's great. Yeah, it's it's been, you know, it's been interesting. It's been interesting just listening to you, Merv, right? And um, going all the way back to those days of the Motown days and stuff like that and the Joel Busby days and all of that and just remembering that time and those that were going through at that time, you know, before before you say Keith Harris and Les Spain, and yeah. the last year, you know, and I you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, you just remember those times, and you remember all of those guys who were trying to continue to open doors and open doors and and stretch the boundaries, and and you know, I remember Robert Lemon, for instance, who you know was at Polygram, right, yeah. as the street. Like, like you see, you know, promotions and stuff like this. And all of these guys were like so instrumental in helping people like me who was coming through and breaking at the time. Imagination, loose ends, um, dancing type. All of these, all of us, you know, who were breaking oh, through. Central line. Oh my God. Come on. Oh my God. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, it's like that whole thing of everybody was breaking through and coming through on a different, it's like on a different train track, you know, but they were breaking it down. If it was working within the industry, they were breaking it down. If they were outside or an artist, they were breaking it down, going into Europe and having success, going into America and having success. I think that time was an incredible time in terms of being able to see what, if you like, the, the, the fruits of your labor, young man. Mm -hmm. To see all of those who've come back, all of those who've come behind you off of the basis of what you'd put down as a foundation. Visionary is what you should be called. Oh, thank you so much. And, and Junior, thanks for uh, coming on. Um, uh, what are you doing at the moment, Junior? Um, you know, what have you got coming? I've got a new single coming out in about four weeks' time. Uh, new album will be out um, the end of all, well, the end of um, April. And... Um, it's a duets album that I did with some reggae artists that I really, really enjoyed as a kid growing up. And also those that I'd worked with back in the day, starting with like Stephen Marley, uh, Luciano, uh, Carol Thompson, Janet Kay, Paulette Taja, Tabby Diamond. You know, a lot of these people appear, you know, it's like going back, to be quite honest, it's like going back home. So it's like going back to my roots, if you like, and, and making an album that was really inspired by my daughter to, to, to do this. I keep going to Jamaica. I have a place down there and stuff. And, and I just never, ever wanted to make me music down there because I was always with her and we were spending that time. But when she, unfortunately, she passed. And after she passed, I, I decided that, like, you know, I need to do this. And maybe it was a cleansing for myself and also that she inspired me to make that move. So, being, as I said, that's the projects. In terms of live work, obviously nothing until next year or yeah. hopefully later this year if it opens up. Yeah. But, um, until such time, it's like writing songs and looking at producing and, and continuing to do what I do. Well, you're getting a lot of love from our um, chat room, as every guest has uh, all, all evening and all night tonight. Um, listen, you're going to sing us a special song for Merv. He doesn't yeah. know that you're going to be singing this. <clears throat> but um, uh, before we do, if we can get Merv back on the screen and give him a big thank you, and then you can play us out if, if that's okay. That's uh, cool, before, before we play him out, be before we go to Merv, can we just give our gratitude to Junior Giscom for having one of the biggest street anthems for the street sounds, when we're talking about some of the icons back in the day, mystery, touch of class, company soul sound, um, studio, you know, some of those sounds that came up, Brothers, Just Good really? Friends, through that. Those, your track, 1990, yeah. Morning Has Come. Yeah. is such an iconic tune for the streets, and we love that so much. 
great track. I absolutely adore that song. Yeah, being mother, being mother, though, I think Mama used to say is a great one, but we never know. We, we never know which record he's going to sing, Merv. No, you know, I, know, I like this. Did you, know, did you like that yeah. one, somebody? I like this one. <laughs> 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 the struggle and the fight I had to get that picture done, you won't believe it's another story. 1984. <laughs> Wicked. Oh, well, Merv, it's been incredible hearing your story. I just hope that this is a great bit of inspiration to anybody out there who um, doesn't think they can make it. You know, you are the epitome of somebody who has risen in the ranks. Um, still rubbish at golf, but still, we're not going to go there. <laughs> but you know, done really well to, to to do really well in the music industry. You've given so much love to so many people. Obviously, from Angie to um, June, we could have had nearly you know a hundred guests on here uh, talking about mm. your career and your involvement. And we just want to say thank you so much for um, coming on to set the trend and, and you know, like giving that. Oh, yeah, I would like to say thank you for inviting my son to come and play golf with you. He had a fantastic day and he was on your team and it was the winning team. Was that your son? That yeah. Is- you didn't tell me that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you. The stories that you said today is fantastic. And I think, you know, you, you've achieved so much. I would like to see that in a book because that would be a perfect reading. And from my part, Thank you for giving so much love to the streets as well as. Um, it definitely helped raise our profile. It definitely helped do what we do best, which is Blake, Blake Black music, and it's especially music that needs to be seen and heard to a wider um, audience. And you also gave, um, you also connected us up and made a network, which I think is very important for us coming down, because there's many people who met with the street team that came to be part of street teams elsewhere because they got that inspiration they were inspired by what was going on there so mm-hmm. thank you very much on, thank on that you. and thank on that note we're going to hear from junior then we'll we be back amongst the cells about thank you very much merv much appreciated junior thank please you. take thank it away take it away
want to know just what it is this spirit coming over me I, I want to know just where to find it oh morning will come with the rise of the sun showing me the way the way I must live at the dawn of the day spirits will rise to find a new way morning will come with the rise of the sun showing me the way the way I must live at the dawn of that day spirits will rise to find a new new way yeah, 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 yeah. Woo. Fire. yes All right. yes Fire. you know what you gotta do you break down Junior. All thank right, so James. Much. All right, James. Go. Oh. Thank you. Thank Make you so business. much. Pleasure. Make up business. And firm. Pleasure. And firm. And firm. Say thing short. Junior just um, in the building. Um, it's such a pleasure to get. You know what? I, I, I don't know how it feels for you, but um, f- for me to hear it, that record is 30 years old. Yeah. Um, when you remember being 20 and you used to listen to records that were 30 years old then or 20 years old then, could you ever believe that your record would be such an anthem alongside some of the great records that have been sung to be sung 30 years on? I, I, I always remembered when I did Mama used to say, I um, was touring America and I went into this big distribution house, you know, and with all of these records stacked up and everything like this. And they were going back and they were saying, take whatever you like. And all the records that I was going for were like what you said 20, 30 years ago, you know, Hella Fitzgerald and, and all of that kind of stuff. Great, yeah. And the guy turned and he said to me, what would you, same question, what would you, what would you like to be remembered for? And I said, you know, I just want to make records that last. And he laughed. Yeah, and that's all I wanted to do was to make records that lasted. And when Morning Will Come came around and Morning Will Come, it's, as you say, it's 30 years. I've, I'm, I'm living my dream. I, I wanted to touch people with my music. And that's all I wanted to do and see people smile. I, I remember going to a dance and they played Morning Will Come and every boop, 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 boop. <laughs> oh, man, I'm feeling it. I was on fire, you know, you just, everything was like jingling like this inside of me, you know, everybody in the place. I went to, you talk about mystery. I went to a mystery dance one night and they put on more in the camera. Junior, junior, he is here in the room. He is here. So. Oh, listen, listen, <laughs> done, done. My man, my man played about four or five o'clock in the morning and the place was still jamming and everybody was singing it. You just. You, you can't, I can't really explain what that feels like. You just, it's, it's like you're just on, you're over the top. To be able to do, to be able to have done that, it, it, it's just, I don't know what to say. It's a joy. You know, I, I hope I can continue to do that and make records that continue to last and, and make people happy and make people enjoy and want to make music and want to play music and want to dance to music, you know? I think every artist wants to do that. Junior, we want to invite you back on um, to be with some of the greats, because we really want to talk about some of the old times with some of the great UK artists that are still here. So we hope you'll accept that invite to come back. um, Definitely. Expand on the the history. But for now, thank thank you for being part of Set the Trend. Thank you for coming on. We salute one of the Don Dadders of the street sounds Absolutely. black music yes, industry mm-hmm. in the building. Junior mm-hmm. Gisco. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, man. Bless you. Oh, yeah. Please Thank bless you. Bless you. Yeah, ah, my days. Wow. Oh, what a, what a podcast hey. today. What a podcast today, boy. Hey, Angie Stone, <laughs> Junior Giscom. 
Ivan Mateus. Junsa Pong. And Mervlin yeah. And the big Don, the big boss himself in the building. Mervlin. Come on, man. You well, know, great. when we talk about legacies, when we talk about setting the trend, that's what we're talking about right there. Indeed. Indeed. Wow. Indeed. Indeed. You know, and, and, and uh, you know what the greatest thing is? That he's still giving back. And, you know, he's running his own brand partnerships company at the moment called the Strategic, Strategic Partnership Solutions. But he's still giving back. Did you see the number of boards he's on? You're, yeah. you're the Duke. You should have. You should have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's working on it. <laughs> he's giving back. Once you're a giver, you get back. And that yeah. is the ultimate of being, you know, you're like, like from, from you're a giver in this society, it will come back and bless you. 50 million times. And as you can see, he is truly blessed. He is someone, you know, that whatever, where, wherever he turns, people love him and people have something good to say about him. And that's because of the person that he is and what, and what, and what he's given to the business. Yeah. So, you know, having him on the show as someone who's not really known outside of his own mm. corridor, his own lane, and to say something, mm. I think the streets will now... You know, I think it's important that the streets see us more than just the streets sometimes because Mervyn's Mer yeah. really like one of us, really. To, to, he to is. Be I mean, to be fair, I mean, you know, you see the Diddies and you see the executives that are kind of like flamboyant, like the Andre Harrells and people like that. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to be in the limelight to have made a difference. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be in the limelight to have made a difference. And, you know, that's something that I've taken from Merv, which is you don't need to be everywhere to make stuff happen you know you work quietly behind the shadows yeah, that's, one his, that's, one, that's one of his strap lines isn't it you don't have to be seen yeah you know, he, he likes making the moves from behind no, no you don't have to eat can't you don't have to eat caviar every day but yeah you will eat bro. but you have to eat <laughs> <laughs> listen, you eat, you, yeah. listen it's been great yeah. man i mean we've got mother's day tomorrow uh, before we get... go there, let me, yeah. let me suggest something. Um, um, I saw a couple. Of... He didn't remember about Alicia Keys coming to the. Um... Oh yeah, <laughs> you know what? I, yeah, I didn't want to laugh. Pause, I... pause, 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 pause. Yeah. I, I, I have to finish. But Tyrese. he mentioned the street team, mm -hmm. and he mentioned Tyrese mm -hmm. going to the streets, and he mentioned Usher going to the streets. Yeah, he signed. I them just all... like to say that he signed them all off. Good on him. Not only did he sign them all off, <laughs> you signed off your plaque. Not only did he sign them all off, but it, but this gentleman here was involved in every one of those eyes. We brought Asha to Newham College. We brought Tyrese to Roger Manwood School down in Crofton, and we brought Alicia Keys to Rockbourne Youth Club. And the street team, as I said, how important it is for your network. Because if it wasn't for the street team, that he created and he had put on the streets to do just that we would never have been connected to the record companies we, we would never had a voice to get these artists down to talk to i think all of them was talking to um usher was talking to college so it was 19 plus uh, sorry 16 plus mm -hmm. and the and the youth club was just a youth club with people of various ages up to 18 and um, crofton park school was talking to the whole school so that was a secondary school we would never have got that we wouldn't that would never ever have been impacted in, on any of those young people's life. They would never have got to see those kind of eyes there. And that's the kind of stuff that was possible because the street team was signed off yeah, and they were doing their job. And what a special signed. mention to people like Reds and uh, Martin Moulton, Jasmine, who, and we've got, we actually did a chat with H. them. So, you know, you've got to big them up as well. H. H. Oh, yeah. H. H. yeah. Well, I think H has, H has been told today, isn't it? <laughs> Somewhere, well, mm, mm. <laughs> so big up to Mervyn Lee. <laughs> Respect, thanks for coming on. This, and this is what this podcast is all about. It's about connecting, it's about connecting the dots, really, and mm. um, showing how 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 much effect that the street also had on music. You know, what I'm saying to you, we was not just there to play in blues dances and warehouses. We was there to break artists and to make the culture get bigger and stronger and everybody was playing their part in that so yeah. we hope you enjoyed that show 
we've got to say thank you to everyone in the chat room. We didn't get a chance to read out their comments. Oh, so many. Today. But um, thank you for being there week in and week out. Fully appreciated. Yeah, thanks for sorry. That one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Here's Morgan, you know. Anyway, they're cheeky in there. I'm not even going to read some of their chat room. Um, he's, he's cheeky. Um, he's, what are you up to this week, son? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to the Breakfast Blues tomorrow because your 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 number one your number one troller has said that he didn't mention you in the story. So you know that's going to be coming up tomorrow. I can't. I am mentioned. I am. <laughs> no, listen, as I said, I don't have to be up front. I was mentioned. We were part of it. That's all I care about. Yeah. So, yeah. So, what am I up to this next week? It's Tuesday night, Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. uh, and as per usual, work meetings and trying to get some shows over the line for the end of the year and early 2022. And uh, for me, I'm going to put on a tin hat, first of all, for the uh, after meeting. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I'm going to be on London Soul Radio, Mother's Day special, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on London Soul Radio. So tune in on Monday as well, 3 to 6 p.m. We keep it rolling and uh, just doing the usual business stuff that I do. And uh, hopefully, you know, work on my golf swing. So um, next time you ask that question. Oh, uh, before. Yes, quite important. Producers, can we have up next week's show? Because we haven't even talked about next week's show. Oh, yet. my God. Yeah. And we need to do that before I even tell you what we're doing. So can we get up the... Um, artwork. Yes, the Dark Destroyer is in the building next week, Saturday, and we're going to tell you what connection he has with street sounds. You may not know. Mm -hmm. You may just think that 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 Sean Wallace is um um. Oh, what's what's the what's the program he's on again? Sorry, the uh, chase. The chase. Sorry, the chase. And I'm going to tell you about the time that I chased the chaser, but that's but that's for next week. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, <I> did um. <laughs> But we're going to tell you the connection that he has with street sounds and street culture mm -hmm. next week. Sean Wallace is in the building. Also, Quincy Comedian is in the building talking about his new um, production. Um, he's, it's, and, and it's quite a production at that. And he's going it to is. be talking about what, he, what, he, what he's yeah. doing. And also we have an exclusive performance by the legend that is Sherry Brown. Next week, she'll be singing live on Set the Trend podcast. For all you rare groovers in the building, this one is definitely for you next week, Saturday, 10 p.m. Like, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Set the Trend Podcast, and on Facebook, Set the Trend Podcast. Your boys are in the building. Tomorrow morning, I'm on Breakfast Blues. You can catch me <laughs> on Breakfast Blues, Fifth Avenue Official, Facebook, Mixcloud Pro, Twitter, and um, something else. <laughs> yeah, there's um, I, yeah. I, might, I might host you on my Twitch page, actually. Twitch. Huh? I'm, I might host you on my Twitch page as well to all um, 23 followers. <laughs> yeah, Reggie Styles DJ. Followers, man. They're, they're like every every mick will make a muckle. As they yeah, say. Reggie, Reggie Styles DJ on Twitch. <laughs> yeah. So um, you can catch me in the morning. I'm up at nine o'clock with a special guest in the building tomorrow morning. So it won't only be me. Last week I had Danger. It's Is it Lady me. Bridgerton? I mean, like Danger ain't a guest. but Is it Lady Bridgerton? No females on my, on, on, on my show. None. On Mother's Day? No, I, I will be obviously praising females on Mother's Day. <laughs> um, but no females on Mother's Day. Okay, podcast. all right. Anyway, let's yeah. go before we get you into trouble. <laughs> I'll tell the bus a rude boy. Anyway, <laughs> we'll see you next week. Like and share our podcast on YouTube and on Facebook. Go back and see some of the shows that we've got. They're all on YouTube. You can go to our YouTube channel. They're all there for you to see and you and you can still comment on them. Not in real time, but obviously you can still leave your comment on them as they go on. So we're out of here. Thank you to the producers. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the females out there for Set the Trend podcast. Enjoy your day tomorrow. Make sure you're sport rotten. And don't forget the mothers who are not here. Please remember the, 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 the um, mothers that have gone. Peace. We're out of here. Set the trend podcast. The boys are out of here. Mervyn Lynn, Don Dada. <laughs> Video. Hey guys, happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers that are watching it right now. And in particular, happy Mother's Day to my mum, special woman in my life. Love you lots and hope you have a great day.
tomorrow on Mother's Day. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers that are, the mothers to be, and the mothers who are no longer with us. Today is all about you. Enjoy your special day. Happy Mother's Day. In all honesty, you know it and I know it, every day is actually Mother's Day. You know, we think about our mums, we might call our mums every day or every other day. We might see them only on a Sunday, but uh, for some mothers, they're no longer here. My mum is no longer here, but I still love, respect, admire and think about her. Today is that day that we worship, maybe worship's a strong word, but we, we, we just mark, put to one side this day in acknowledging you as the wonderful human you are. You brought us into this world. You've nurtured us selflessly. And we thank you for that. Happy Mother's Day. So it's Mother's Day. A big happy Mother's Day going out to all the mothers out there. Uh, very special people. And without them, you wouldn't have us. So to all the mothers out there, make sure it's your day. Make sure you get spoiled to the maximum. No cooking. Make sure someone cooks for you. Make sure someone rubs your feet. Make sure someone does all the errands that you don't want to do. Because you deserve it. Your day, you deserve it. Although you still day every day, but this is a very special day. So, happy Mother's Day to all of those out there. Got my flowers for the old deal. She said I didn't need to buy her those kind of flowers. I could have just got Tesco's. See? Mother's humble. So, to my mother, she brought me, she grew me, and she's always been there for me. Much love. Much love to all the mothers. Set the Trump podcast. Mother's Day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Giving a special, special, special dedication to all mums for tomorrow. Not only the biological mums, you know, but the mums who have played a motherly role to somebody in their life. If you're anything like my mum, you've been a mum to a host of other people. And you know what? I have to give them special thanks for that. So, happy Mother's Day for tomorrow, mum, and all the other mums. See you there can do what you've done for me you will always be